All right, my friends, welcome once again to the next episode here, the Red Delta Project podcast and live feed Q&A, helping you to be fit and live free by taking a fundamental approach to diet and exercise. Matt Schifferle, your host, as always. Today's episode is sponsored by the entirety of all of the RDP resources that are all linked down below in the description, because I'm sure I'm going to be referencing many of them, including many books from the RDP library, including micro workouts, grind style calisthenics, and smart bodyweight training. But it's also equipment resources that I'm going to be recommending too, as well as the Dunamic doorway pull-up handles, and of course, uh, people, pieces of equipment with my starter there with uh, pullupdip.com and NOSC suspension straps. So today's topic is the blueprint for how to use and apply intuitive training. Intuitive training, adaptive training, chameleon training, flexible training. It's got all these different names to it. Basically, the point of this type of approach is that you're not following some sort of a dogmatic approach where it's like, this is exactly how you work out every Tuesday. You do exactly these exercises this way kind of thing, which is much more common within our fitness culture. But instead, you have an approach that is flexible, where you're able to make changes on the fly of what exercises you're doing, how you're doing them, how many sets and reps, what weight you're using. All of these things are very malleable, and there's lots of good reasons to be doing this. Uh, first, uh, the biggest reason is three. Uh, first off is that it can be a heck of a lot less stressful on mind, body, and lifestyle. So when we have any dogmatic approach when it comes to fitness, whether it's diet or exercise, and you're saying, I have to do things exactly this way, that's assuming that your circumstances are in alignment with those approaches. But of course, as we all know, life changes. Your time changes, your energy level changes, your physical abilities change. One day your legs feel great, the next day your knees are killing you because you hiked a 14er. One day you're feeling like you've got all kinds of motivation to crush a good workout. And the next day it's everything you can do just to get up off the couch. So your circumstances are always changing. So whenever you've got a very dogmatic, strict workout program, chances are at some point, you're going to be kind of forcing the square peg into the round hole, so to speak. And that causes stress on mind, body, and lifestyle because you're trying to do something that is not in alignment with your circumstances. And to be fair, there's certainly something to be said for kind of making yourself uh, follow along with something in certain circumstances. But especially for people who've been training for 5, 10, 15 plus years, that's not always going to be the case. So that's the first big reason is the ability to just make things a lot easier on mind, body, and lifestyle. The second big reason, of course, is just potential to see far better results. And the reason for this, as we'll explore in a moment here, is because fundamentally, your success does not depend on how close you follow the workout program or even what workout program you follow. That's not to say your workout program isn't important. It certainly is. But I'm never going to tell someone you're going to build muscle if you do these many sets or if you do this exercise. And that's because a lot of the advice in our fitness culture is based largely not on what you actually need to do to get results. It's just basically how much work you need to do. And whenever we base any approach to success on how much work you're doing, it's largely left up to correlation rather than causation. You're giving someone an amount of work to do, crossing your fingers and just hoping by chance that it's going to produce the appropriate result. And of course, these correlations are fed by science and they're very much closely related. So there's probably a good chance that you're going to be doing something that's going to be uh, productive to your goals. But there's never much of a guarantee. And the more things fall out of alignment for you, the less of a chance is actually going to work, even if you're, quote, doing it right. And that's why when we have this intuitive approach, you're not shooting an arrow blindly into the air and hoping you hit the target. You're actually seeing the target, aiming it, and then adjusting your sights accordingly so you hit the darn target with greater accuracy over time. And that produces better results. And finally, the last one, probably the most important one, is it gives you more control. I think fundamentally, this is what we're all in fitness for. We all want more control. We want control over our health. We want control over our performance. We want control over our body and how it looks and feels. And the ironic thing is that we often fall victim to dogmatic approaches to diet and exercise, thinking that if we can force ourselves to follow that dogmatic, strict, 
static program that we will have that control. But ironically, that actually doesn't leave you much more control because then the program is in control. The rules you're following are in control. And that's not a disciplined approach because a disciplined approach is one where you're making choices, you're making decisions, you're looking at circumstances, assessments, and analysis and saying, okay, according to what's going on right now, I think I would actually be better off doing things this way. It comes with experience, it comes with intelligence, but that's discipline. Instead, we often are told in our fitness culture that discipline is about forcing yourself to follow along with the rules. It's like, sit down, shut up, this is what's on the program, do it, because I say so kind of thing. And yeah, again, they, there's a time and a place for that. But when it comes to our own programs and we're doing things on our own, we're the worst drill sergeant there is because usually a drill sergeant doesn't know what they're doing <laughs> or at least what's best for us if we're following dogmatic programs, especially just something you blindly found on the internet. So when we are just following, we're not in control. Something else or someone else is in control. But when you're intuitively training and you're saying, I think I'm better off doing a couple more sets here, you're now more in control. You're making a disciplined choice. You're not just blindly obedient. And that's one of the biggest reasons. So those are the three big reasons why intuitive and adaptive training can be such a godsend. It's something I started several years myself. And my gosh, what a great thing. The better I get at it, it's like, oh my gosh, I'm never going to do anything else. This is so much more fun and so much more rewarding. And I'm getting much better results. And it's just good, 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 good all around. No downside at all. It's all much better. It takes a little more work and experience to get going. But if you follow the rules that I'm going to be giving you today, I promise it's going to be a heck of a lot easier and a lot clearer. I'm also going to be answering your questions too as well. Thank you, everybody, for coming on in. Michael here and Dropweight Daddy. Uh, fantastic, everybody. Again, if you put a hey, Matt, in the subject line, I will answer those questions for you. Let's start off with S. Lee asking, hey, Matt, what are good reasons to do high pull-ups? Because to me, it's like a muscle-up, but I feel much better after doing sets of explosive pull-ups to the waist compared to doing muscle ups. So first off, you're just not taking much of a break in order to do a dip. I addressed this question in a episode a little bit earlier where a muscle up is basically you do one rep of a pull-up followed immediately by one rep of a dip. And usually when it comes to strength training, with some exceptions, of course, but usually I find people just feel better about doing an exercise and get more of what they want out of a muscle if they just keep the pressure on that muscle, they're not taking a break to do something else halfway through a set. So that's one of the biggest reasons right there. The second is you are focusing on explosively pulling yourself up nice and high with that pull up. And anytime we're doing something with a little bit more pop and power, you're just simply creating more tension in the muscle. It's basic physics. It takes more energy to accelerate something against the pull of Earth's gravity than to do it in a slower fashion. So you're creating more tension. And even though the resistance against gravity may be technically the same, you are making the muscle a little bit stronger. And that's the biggest reason. Athleticism could be another one. Power, explosiveness, these are very good qualities to develop. And you're going to do that by doing pull-ups a little bit at a faster tempo, faster on the concentric aspect of things. And then finally, when it comes to your neuromuscular activation, because that's always the foundation to all strength training success, when you're kind of telling your nervous system of like fire on all eight cylinders, you typically have better muscle activation. I addressed this question a little bit earlier on the YouTube channel where someone was citing a study saying that if someone moves more explosively through the concentric part of a lift, that their neuromuscular activation is much better. So they're like, would you rather do that or isometrics? And it kind of depends on the context. I won't get too much into it right now, but it is, is a very good way to just make your muscles work better than if you're just kind of going with the same slow, grindy rep tempo that you have. However, I would say that if you are powerful enough and strong enough that you're getting that high, where you're getting the bar below your chest, probably time to have a higher level of resistance. So either progressive variants like uh, archer pull-ups or something like commando pull-ups, single hand pull-ups, something where you're going to put a lot of force into the muscle, but you're not going to get that high or add weight, of course. So I would progress the resistance if you're getting that much power and explosiveness above the bar. You want enough that you're trying to move as fast as possible, 
but you're still not quite getting that high. In my opinion, if you were a client of mine and we were programming, you're like, I just want to get bigger and stronger. That's what I would give you as far as that advice. Hopefully that makes sense. All right. Very good. Uh, one more before we jump into the things. Super Prime 117. Always good to see you. Uh, thanks. Uh, hey, Matt, do you think it's possible to train strength, power, endurance, uh, balance, agility, sports specificity, all with a one one training session six times a week? Well, let me put it to you this way. Let's look at these things. Strength, power, endurance, balance, agility, and so forth. Uh, yeah, just do lunges. You'll get all of that from lunges. <laughs> So it really boils down to, are we trying to develop a type of these things? And so this is the thing is training, remember, is always specific adaptation to impose demand. One of the most important principles in all of exercise science, the said principle. So you're like, I want strength. Okay, strength for what? You know, I could give you a captains of crusher grip tool. That's going to build strength for crushing your hand like this in your forearm. You know, what kind of strength? What application of strength? It's always about the application. Strength doesn't do anything for you. Endurance doesn't do anything for you. Agility doesn't do anything for you outside of the context of what kind of application. You can run cones all day long and build your, quote, agility. But if you want agility for doing a kick through in the swimming pool, it's not going to do any good because it's the wrong kind of agility. So that's why whenever we're looking at functional applications. We want to train in accordance to what we actually want. Don't just be strong for the sake of being strong. Don't just build agility for the sake of ability. Yes, there's always a good foundation. Push, pull, squat will make you generally overall strong, builds up a good foundation. But typically when someone's like, I need to build these qualities, a lot of times it's like, in what? In what way? When I was in uh, Taekwondo in Vermont, we had terrible endurance as martial artists. Because uh, we gas out in our free sparring in, at tournaments. This is when you had like three rounds, two minutes each for a single match. And we'd be gassed out by the end of it. And people would be like, I don't understand it. I run like 10 miles a week. I'm like, yeah, running 10 miles a week isn't really going to do you a whole lot of good when you're getting your head kicked in. <laughs> but in a two-minute round, it's completely a different kind of endurance. You can be the best you know, 10-mile runner in the world and still have no a good endurance when it comes to sparring. So we were doing drills that mimicked harder rounds of sparring. Would that make you a better runner? No, but it sure as hell made us better martial artists. So you've got to be more specific about what you're doing. And sometimes you can get all that in a single training session, but usually it pays more to pick one exercise for each that kind of focuses on developing that quality. And then you have that and you don't need a whole heck of a lot either. It doesn't take you know 20 minutes to train agility. Just one exercise, 30 seconds, 40 seconds, get it done, an agility ladder or something like that, boom, you're done. You don't need a lot of work when you have a fundamental approach to exercise. And understand the first rule of intuitive training, which is always start understanding the fundamental objective that you're trying to accomplish in your training. See, a lot of times we approach our training with completely the wrong mindset that gets us lost right away. And we're asking ourselves, how many reps should I do if I want to build muscle? How many sets should I do if I want to get stronger? How many uh, cone drills should I run if I want to do agility? Again, this is not the right way to be asking questions to get the answers you really need. Because that's all based off of a methodological approach to fitness, which is based on the premise, incorrectly, that you're going to get results because of the work you do. But that's not how fitness works. You don't get results because of how much or what kind of work you do. You get results by how well you can achieve the fundamental objectives of training. And when you know that, then you do whatever exercises, whatever training, whatever work you need to do to best accomplish that. You're never going to overdo it. You're never going to underdo it. You're always going to hit the nail right on the head. So the analogy I gave earlier, is like blindly shooting an arrow into the air. Now you're going to hit something, <laughs> you know, that's the old joke, right? I'm the world's greatest archer. Oh yeah, let's see. And you just shoot an arrow blindly and you end up hitting like a stop sign of half a mile away. And you're like, yep, I meant to hit that stop sign. You know, that's how you become the best sharpshooter in the world. Just shoot blindly and then call whatever you hit the target, right? That's usually the way fitness works in most cases for people because they're just going off on correlation versus causation. 
But when you understand the fundamental objective of your training session, you know where that target is. And that gives you two things. One, a greater chance of actually getting what you want from the training session, but two, the ability to assess and evaluate whether or not what you're doing is actually working or not, whether or not it's getting you closer to that target. You know, I used to be big into archery back in the day and I had a little sight on it and stuff. And if my arrows were grouping down and to the left, I knew I needed to adjust my sight so that way the grouping would move more closer to the target. I could adjust what I was doing according to what I was doing, uh, getting closer to that objective. But if you don't know what the objective is, whatever you do is blindly guesswork. And that's unfortunately the way we usually work. So this is much more in detail in my book, Micro Workouts. Link is down below, shameless plug, because that's how micro workouts work, is when you know your objective, you usually find that you can accomplish what you want with far less time and energy and a lot less wasted time and energy. But the point is that there are three fundamental objectives. The first one is the easiest one, energy expenditure, either caloric physical energy, or sometimes it's, it's like a cathartic emotional energy. And sometimes, you know, it's just like, I just got to go for a run. I'm so stressed out. I got to, you know, go for a bike ride, hike a 14 er out here in Colorado or something. Just, oh, and I come back and like, oh, I needed that. that. That feels so good to get some rounds on the punching bag or something. That's also in alignment with that goal. So that's the easiest objective to hit because you do that doing anything, <laughs> right? Anything you do whatsoever will help you accomplish that objective. But typically things that require a modest amount of intensity or a good amount of time are going to help you accomplish it more. So that's the easiest objective. You're just going out like, I just want to burn off energy or stress or calories or fat or whatever. Just go, just do something. Uh, second objective is neuromuscular conditioning. And this is usually referred to as, of course, strength work, but it can be uh, a lot of high intensity like hill sprints, you know, pushing a weight sled, uh, sprinting on a mountain bike, uh, things like that. So this is usually uh, broken down into how well you can work your muscle, how hard you can work your muscle as far as intensity, contractile force, that's aka strength, how long you can make a muscle contract relative to time, endurance, and of course, how much you're pushing the two of those things uh, in order to produce a good degree of fatigue in the muscle, particularly if you're going for uh, either endurance or hypertrophy. So that's the objective of neuromuscular conditioning. And that's more specific than energy expenditure, but it's not that specific. You can do that pretty much any way you can, as long as there's a good enough amount of resistance. Calisthenics, band work, lifting rocks, free weights, machines, really, it doesn't matter that much. As long as you're just making the muscle work progressively harder over time, the method you actually use is just whatever you like kind of stuff. And we'll get into that a little bit more in, the few, in, uh, in a bit. And then the third objective is performance, proficiency. And that's much more specific as I was alluding to earlier, because that's when we're coming into our training session saying, I want to get better at doing this thing in this way. So for me, I might be saying, okay, uh, for example, I got a new mountain bike and it's got some different geometries and I'm having a bit of oversteer, particularly around tight corners. So I need to work on turning a little bit tighter when I'm mountain biking, particularly uphill on switchbacks. So I might do a series of switchbacks, purposely thinking I need to steer a few more degrees to compensate for my habitual oversteering because the geometry of the bike is better, uh, is, uh, is a little bit different. So I might do a workout where I'm going through those switchbacks purposely. I don't care about calorie burn. I'm not trying to condition my muscles. I'm just trying to get better at turning on a dime. That's my objective. And that's the proficiency objective. Now, to be fair, you're always going to accomplish all three of those things, no matter what you do. Okay. If I lift this glass of water, it is requiring a certain amount of caloric expenditure. It is requiring a certain amount of time and tension and neuromuscular activation in order for me to do this. And it's going to require me to do it in such a skillful way that I'm not like trying to crush this glass or, you know, I'm not spilling the water and stuff. So energy expenditure, neuromuscular conditioning, and proficiency are present in everything we do, even in something we're unconsciously doing, like if I take drink from that water. But when we are going to our workouts and we have an objective-based approach into our training, we are picking what we want to accomplish, and then our goal is to accomplish that objective as much as possible. 
That's an objective-based approach. That's what your intuitive training is all about. It's not about how many sets do I need to do and how many reps do I do and what kind of exercise order do I do? It's like, that's my objective. Then you go forth and you do whatever the hell you want and can in order to accomplish that objective. And that's naturally going to change over time. Your objective is typically pretty set, but you're going to change how you go about it because your circumstances are always changing. And that's what we're going to get into with part two coming up here. But let me get to some more questions from you fine folks. Dan Osek is coming on saying, hey, Matt, in the book, Max Muscle Control, he says, when contracting a muscle, relax all the others. Uh, we are taught in isometrics to make each exercise a total body exercise. Thoughts? Yeah, um, I think... I think Maxic was, was just simply mistaken in this order uh, because uh, in uh, the Overcoming Isometrics manual through Dragon Door, they talk a lot about irradiation. And that's not an isometrics thing. That's just an exercise thing. Uh, they talk about that with powerlifting in The Purposeful Primitive by Marty Gallagher. They talk about that in all the kettlebell training they do, uh, irradiation. And that's also in alignment with chain training here at Red Delta Project. You don't necessarily want things to be relaxed. Now, a lot of times when people, especially they come across chain training the first time, they're like, okay, I'm going to do pushups. And they're like all tight and everything's rigid and everything. And they can barely move. I'm like, no, 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 <laughs> you're not contracting things as hard as possible, mind you, you know, cause then you can't move. Uh, and there's also no proficiency with that. You're just tightening everything up as much as you can. And with isometrics, that may certainly be the case. However, there's still some coordination to be able to take a muscle and these are the prime movers and you want a lot of tension there, but then there's supportive muscle where you want some tension, but it doesn't need to be maxed out. It just needs to be supportive. Uh, sometimes people will ask me like, oh, farmer carries, is that a good way to work the chest? I'm like, what do you mean? It's like, well, it works everything. So is it a good way to work? And no, I wouldn't give you farmer carries if you're trying to build a bigger, stronger chest. I give you like push-ups or dips or something, but it, it works the chest. No, it uses the chest. There's a difference there. It's like back in the day when I was, again, in the martial arts, our instructor always says, you know, martial arts works every muscle in the body. Uh, you don't need to lift weights or anything like that. And then I would argue, it's like, well, it uses all of your muscles. I wouldn't say it adequately works the muscles. And there, therein lies the challenge. So you want to use as much muscle as possible for most any exercise that you're doing. But the key is what muscles are really working at their capacity. So if you're doing, for example, uh, tension control for your biceps, I'm still using my shoulders. I'm still stabilizing with my back. I'm not trying to exert the maximum force in those areas, but you do want some tension. And I, I just simply believe Maxic was a little bit mistaken with that. But he might have been going off on the idea that if everything is tight, then you just kind of blow your, uh, yourself out. So you have enough relaxation so you can really focus on the muscles you're working on, but you don't want it to be relaxed there. It's fine tuning things. It's the proficiency of tension control. Zorati Karate is saying, hey, Matt, I was wondering if doing uh, four by four by four by four by four by four for chin-ups is enough for hypertrophy for the time being for back activation. No possible way to know, my friend. And again, this is the methodological approach that is... Uh, when we're saying, if I do this much work, will it be effective? No possible way to know. Your ability to get results does not depend on how much work you do. I don't care how much work you do. You could do a little, you could do a lot. Will that be enough? Who the hell knows? It's all about how well are you achieving the fundamental objective of your workout? That's what's important. Okay, so let's let's do this in practical application now. So chin-ups for hypertrophy. We're looking for hypertrophy. Okay, one of the greatest, uh, strongest influences to stimulate hypertrophy, because honestly, we don't really know why we get hypertrophy too much. Every single time we take one single variable, like hormones or going to failure or strength and stuff, every time we try and isolate something in a lab, it doesn't really pan out. So we're not, you know, hypertrophy is kind of one of those almost mysterious things. It's like, I don't really know why we get this to happen. But there is certainly a very strong correlation between neuromuscular fatigue and hypertrophy. We got to push our muscles to the point where we're really kind of making them fairly tired and working hard. So the question for you to ask then, Zorati Karate, is how do you feel at the end of that 4x4x4x4x4? 
Okay. At the end of that, are you kind of grinding out those reps and feeling like, boy, that was, that's about all that muscle had in it. Then I would say it's probably on the right track. But if you're on that last set of four and you're just like one, two, three, four, I don't think it's going to be the best stimulus for you there. Uh, it's probably needing to be a little bit harder. So adjust the resistance accordingly uh, in order to make that happen. So when we're going for hypertrophy, you want to be focusing on engaging the muscle powerfully and bringing it to a high state of fatigue. So the question then is, will that do it for you? Right back at you. Joseph Bello saying, Haluma, are deficit push-ups enough to build the upper, uh, upper lower on or middle? I, I think it's just a little typo there. Upper lower are the chest. Uh, are pike push-ups enough to build shoulder? Do I need a second exercise? So don't don't break things up like this so much, guys. You know this is a question coming from the world of bodybuilding, and the reason why so much of bodybuilding gets segmented is because they've got specialized exercises that break the body up so much. So when you've got exercises that focus on the upper chest, that also means you're not working the rest of the chest very well. Okay, so it's a glass half full, half empty kind of deal. It's like oh, the glass is half full. Yeah, it's also half empty versus calisthenics training should be, should, mind you, just fill the glass to the brim and don't ask questions and stop worrying about it. You know, so if you're doing your push-ups, I don't care what push-ups, just push-ups, your whole chest should be lit up like a freaking Christmas tree, man. Use the whole thing. And oftentimes it's in here. Remember, tension control is not controlled by the exercise. Exercises do not work muscles. Your brain does that. The exercise is just the application. The exercise is the application for the tension your brain is putting there. So if someone's like, I don't feel it in this muscle, I'm like, you've got to put it there then. You need to make the muscle work. Don't ever rely on the exercise to make the muscle turn on. Whenever you do that, you're not in control of that tension as much as you should be. And you should be in very much control of that tension. You should feel your whole chest working every single rep and set of every single pushing exercise you ever do. Freaking tricep extensions, man. Turn it into a chest exercise. Turn that sucker on like we were talking about earlier. Use the chest. Don't fragment and segment things up like that because that's a bad habit to get into. And it's totally unnecessary too. Um, and then back when you were talking about pipe pushups, uh, you can build your shoulders without any direct shoulder work. It was big thing back in the 90s. A lot of bodybuilders were avoiding direct shoulder work because they're like, why would I work my shoulders more? They're already getting blasted with everything else I'm doing. Uh, so I, I always look at shoulder work as like accessory work, you know, pike push-ups, handstands, things like that. It's accessory work. I still will make like push-ups and pull-ups and rows my bread and butter. And then every once in a while, I'll be like, yeah, put pike push-ups just to kind of put a little kiss on to the shoulders there. And uh, usually that's that's the approach I like to use with that. Um, so yeah, don't take a bodybuilding approach with these as far as a segmented approach. Just blast the hell out of everything all the time. And you find you won't need to you know focus on the upper chest. As Lee's coming back on saying, hey Matt, are burpees worth to incorporate in a training program? Or is it more beneficial to do push-ups, jump, squat separately to increase the stimulus and minimize the risk of injuries. Well, whenever something comes down to, is it worth it? That's always a question for you personally. You know, Cause some people it's a different story. Now for me personally, I, I believe the burpee is just not worth it. It's a high cost, low reward exercise. It's really hard to do. And it doesn't really, it's not that effective for doing anything other than just getting better at burpees <laughs> kind of thing. And I like where your mindset is right now because you're like, what if I just separate these things? Yeah, exactly. Push-ups. If you came to me and you're like, I want to get a bigger, stronger chest, I sure as hell I'm not giving you burpees. You know, let's do the push-ups. Let's go for a direct stimulus. And that's kind of what we're going after when we have these objectives. Use methods that are much more direct towards what you want. Don't beat around the bush. Don't be inefficient and take these roundabout, meandering, cockamamie methods that use a lot of time and a lot of energy, and they just kind of sort of are lukewarm. It's kind of like saying, I want to get drunk as hell tonight, and I'm going to take light beer and water it down <laughs> and see how much I can drink. It's like, yeah, you're going to drink a lot of volume. You're going to feel like crap. It's like, how about just a few shots of whiskey? And <laughs> there you go. Like, let's go directly after what we're doing. And so that's the way I would look at it is, um, you know, the burpee is just a high cost, low reward activity. 
in, in my opinion. And I know I get flack about that. I made a, a video stating this opinion years ago. And so many of the comments that disagree with me are saying, ah, people don't like burpees. They're wusses, they're whims, because it's a really hard exercise. People don't like doing it because it's so hard. I'm like, yeah, that's a damn good reason not to do them. Okay, it's not inherently good or valuable because it caught because it's hard. I fell for that cockamamie nonsense for years myself, where I would purposely put myself through hellish activities and make things harder on myself on purpose, thinking if I'm putting more in, I'm going to get more back, right? No, there's no problem with that. Hard work is nothing more than an investment of your time and energy. And there is never any guarantee that it's going to pay off. In fact, it very frequently doesn't. It very If I look back on my training career, especially those early years, the first 10, 15 years, most of the work I did, if I knew that better then, I was like, I wouldn't bother with any of that stuff because it was just a lot of work and it wasn't worth it, which is why motivation tanks. Because when your motivation is tanking, that's literally your subconscious saying, what you're doing is not paying off. Do something else. Stop doing this. Don't just keep beating your head against the wall. So that's my thought on it. But you could be like, dude, there's nothing better than waking up and starting the day with burpees. I just love doing them. That alone is reason to do them. That alone could be a good reason. It's like, I just do 15, 20 burpees, wakes me up. I feel like a million dollars. I'm just an animal. I can take on, uh, great. That'll. Who cares if it's effective at building the chest or whatnot? If it makes you feel that way, that alone is good enough reason to do it. So it always boils down to what's the payoff for you? For me, there's hardly any payoff. So why would I bother doing it? But for you, if there's a great payoff, then why do you even need my thoughts on it? Because your thoughts are the only ones that really matter in that regard. So we've got our objectives. Part one, you always start with your objectives when you're working out in general, but especially with intuitive training. What are you trying to accomplish? Energy expenditure, neuromuscular conditioning, or improving proficiency. What of those are you trying to accomplish? Ideally, just one of those, you can focus on it, have some direct training on it, but sometimes you can do a couple things. You know, like I'm going for a bike ride and I need to work on my tighter turns on switchbacks, but I'm also going for a bike ride because it makes me feel really good and I'm burning off a lot of stress. Okay, great, I'm achieving multiple objectives there. So then what do you do? Well, then you work within your means, okay? You take stock of your resources. And you use whatever resources you have the ability to use to accomplish that objective in your current circumstances. Okay, so this includes time. Okay, what do you have for time? I only got 15 minutes. Okay, then you're using 15 minutes. Energy. You know, man, I'm not feeling so good today. I am really beat up and tired. I went for a, a good bike ride on the 4th of July with uh, my buddy Chris. And I don't know why that ride totally kicked my butt because it wasn't a ride I haven't done a million times already, but I just can't seem to get back on my feet for the past few days. I think I might've been coming down with a bit of a cold or something. Plus I did not eat well at all that day. It's my own fault. So the past few days, my energy level and ability has just been <clears throat> dropped down. So I'm working within that energy level. My workouts have been shorter. They've just been working with slightly less intense, you know, speeds and tempos and stuff just because I just don't have the energy. You know, I have a little bit less. Motivation is another resource. Sometimes you're really, you know, chomping at the bit and you're going to bite through steel. Great. Go for it. Other times you're like, man, it's going to take me everything I have to get out of bed this morning. It's like, okay, then, you know, start off a little bit lighter, a little bit smaller kind of thing. Equipment resources too. It was always funny to me where, you know, the most dogmatic trainers or workout uh, individuals in the world sometimes would be in gyms. I always kind of made the joke of some of the biggest, I know it's not a, a nice thing to say, but some of the biggest crybabies in the world are sometimes the hardcore gym goers because, man, you take away that curl bar they love to use and the whole world is falling down. It's like, well, do dumbbell curls. I can't do dumbbell curls. I need my special curl bar you know, or the, the plates they like to use or the treadmill, their one favorite treadmill. It's like the one next to it's the same, you know, but this one's out of order. It's like, I know, but that's my treadmill. I have to use my treadmill. That's a very dogmatic approach. But when you have the intuitive adaptive approach, you're like, oh, treadmill's down. Okay. Um, I'm going to push the weight sled. That'll get my heart rate up. Okay, great. Good. You know, whatever. 
and that gives you the flexibility to adapt to your circumstance. I don't have the equipment. I don't have the motivation. I don't have the time. I don't have the energy. Okay, great. What do you have? <laughs> you know, what can you use? And then you use whatever you got to accomplish that objective. Now, to be clear again, that objective is on a scale. It's not like you have to cross a finish line, unless your objective is to cross a literal finish line. Uh, your objective is not going to be like, okay, this workout is only effective if I do a certain amount of work, because then that's a methodological approach, or if I do things a certain way, because you're accomplishing that objective from the word go. You literally run up a flight of stairs. You burned calories. You had some work in your muscles. You're working on the skill of keeping your shoulders loose as you're running, whatever, right? You're always accomplishing those objectives. The only thing you're changing in your workouts is how much are you accomplishing that objective? To what degree? Okay. It's not that you, you have to do it a certain amount in order for it to be effective. It's just how much are you getting? When I rode my bike with my buddy the other day, it was a three hour ride and most of it was uphill because that's how it works in the Rockies. <laughs> you know, spend very little time going downhill, a lot of time going uphill. So I burned a lot of calories. That was a hell of a lot more of achieving the objective of energy expenditure than if I just did a couple of quick hill sprints. Okay, so that was more of that accomplished. Does that mean work, uh, doing some hill sprints is not a worthwhile way to burn off some stress and energy and some calories? No, of course not. It's still good. It's just a question of how much are you accomplishing that objective? And then you just use whatever methods and abilities and workouts are going to fit in your present circumstances. And that's why it's so much easier on mind, body, and lifestyle is that you're adaptable to your circumstances to use whatever you have on hand in order to accomplish that objective, which you're guaranteed to accomplish. There's no such thing as an ineffective workout. It's just a question of how much. How much are you going to get out of it? How much can you accomplish that objective? And my attitude is always, I'll take what I can get. You know, some days, sure, you can get a lot. You can really create a hell of a stimulus. But other days you're like, well, it wasn't much, but still worth it. Still a hell of a lot better than zero. And it really helps to break you out of that all or nothing kind of mindset, which usually ends up being nothing because you can't do it all. But uh, it's very much uh, something uh, to be mindful of. Okay, let's see if I missed some questions here. Let's see. Hi, pull-ups. I got that one. It's always good to talk to you folks. Thanks for coming on in. Okay, we got got some more here. Ah, I was already saying, I was wondering, oh, I got that one as well. Okay, good, I got everybody. Hardly ever happens. I always miss questions and uh, address things uh, later on. So thank, thank heavens for that. So step one, always start with the objective on hand. What is your objective? Step two is plan out how you're going to accomplish as much of that objective as you can or willing to according to your current circumstances and resources. You don't force square pegs into round holes. If you have more, do more. If you don't have as much or you have to make a change, make the change. You know, Because it's not going to be effective because you use a certain piece of equipment or you do a certain number of sets and reps. It's effective because of how much you accomplish that objective. And again, you're always accomplishing it to some degree. So, hey, you're a winner. <laughs> you know, Everybody gets a trophy kind of thing. Well, yeah, when it comes to exercise, everybody does technically win. It's just a question of how much. How much are you getting out of it? And then finally, the third and probably one of the most crucial aspects of intuitive training is make sure that you are applying some degree of assessment and making adjustments over time because you're going to recognize patterns intuitive training is very good, especially when circumstances really change on you. Like you go off on vacation and you're on a cruise ship or something and you're like, okay, the boat is rocking back and forth because of high seas. I don't think pistol squats are really in the cards for me today because <laughs> I'm just all over the place. Okay, great. You're not doing pistol squats, but they've got really nice set of dumbbells and uh, you know, I could do some dumbbell lunges. Okay, rock on. Eh, it's still a little unstable. How about some goblet squats then? Okay, goblet squats, fantastic, very good. Okay, we're off to the races. So sometimes you do get those changes where your circumstances really modify and you're like, oh, wow, okay, I gotta change things up. But most of the time, it's gonna be somewhat along the lines of patterns, continuous uh, ideas. Like I seem to always be working you know, this muscle on Wednesdays or I, I'm really finding that I'm, I'm getting more out of my pull-ups 
if I do them on Wednesdays instead of Tuesdays, in which case you make that change. So assessment and adjustment is the last part. Because again, when we're blindly following some sort of program in an obedient approach as opposed to a disciplined approach, we typically aren't assessing very much. We're typically not looking at what's working, what isn't, and how can I do it better? Because ultimately your training is effective because it progresses over time. You do things better. Anything that is static, I don't care how effective it is, will lead to a plateau and you're going to be very limited in your approach because you keep just doing the same thing. So that's why we keep a workout log. That's why we just simply even stop and think. It's like, okay, that set of pull-ups felt a lot stronger. Why? Why was that stronger than the set before it? What was different? Contrast and compare. Like, why do I have so much more energy now than I did last week at this time? You know, why am I more motivated? All these sorts of things. When we ask ourselves why, and you can get those answers, those are the things that lead you down a much more productive and effective path. And if we're not assessing things and we're just blindly, you know, crossing our fingers and hoping on luck, it's like, well, I did five by five with 135. Hope that's going to work. It's like, no, how effective were you accomplishing that objective? How effective was that training your strength? You know, as far as how hard your muscles are contracting, yeah, it kind of felt kind of light. Didn't really feel it too much. It's like, okay, right in your workout log, maybe bump up to one, you know, 55 or 75 or something next time or bigger range of motion or whatever. Because the assessment and adjustment over time is what really leads to the better results. And the great thing about intuitive training is that it makes that much more possible because you're constantly looking at where your proverbial area arrows are going according to the target, and then you're adjusting, and then your workouts get better and better and more effective. So that's why it can work, is your workouts get progressively more effective over time. It's not just you keep adding a rep or anything like that, but you're actually getting better at the skill of working out well, at working out proficiently. If you ever see the folks in the gym who have those fantastic results. They're stronger, they're bigger, they look better, whatever the circumstances may be. You, you know who I'm talking about. There's always those, those guys or those people who are like, they are just on a whole nother level. They've done that work over years. They have assessed and they have adjusted things according to what they want. They're not following some cookie cutter program they found on the internet. They're not following some cookie cutter diet or anything. They have learned what works best for them. And then they are intuitively adapting their training style to align with their needs, preferences, and resources. And as a result, their workout is probably more effective in 20 minutes than yours is from an entire week of training because they're that much in better alignment. They know how to achieve that objective so much better than everyone else. So that assessment and adjustment. And this, this is often people think that's a complicated thing. It's really not. It's just simply looking at what you did and saying, what do we do better next time? I took a backcountry skiing and avalanche safety course years ago. And the instructor was always saying at the end of every day out, you just kind of assess and be like, what could you do better next time? And we, at the end of our day, he was saying, what do we do better next time? And he's like, I, for one, didn't pack enough chocolate. <laughs> I had a little piece of chocolate, I ate it, and I thought, I really wish I had more chocolate. Now I know, I need to pack more chocolate next time. It's like, it could be just that simple, right? That little thing, preferably write it down because don't trust your success to your memory. And that alone makes the difference between meh results in a year and a half and holy hell, what happened to you? You look amazing results in a year and a half. So the three steps, the three principles of intuitive training to make it work for you. One, seek objectives, not workload. Okay? Two, do whatever work and whatever abilities you have on hand to achieve the objective as much as you're willing to or can. And three, assess and adjust over time in order to further achieve those objectives to a higher degree and you'll get the better results. That is the blueprint for intuitive and adaptive training, my friends. Let's get to some last questions here when we will be, uh, so I can help you. Frederico, it's good to see you. Hey Matt, it's not your specialty, but who can we consult to increase our mobility with strength and shoulders and hip 
uh, compression. Well, YouTube's probably a good place to just look at that. Shoulder mobility, if you just search up shoulder mobility. Uh, GMB Fitness is always one of my staples uh, for that sort of thing. Those guys, Ryan and Jarlo and everyone, they are the masters at that sort of stuff because it is mobility with strength. They've got so much, I mean, they've forgotten more about mobility training than I will probably ever learn about mobility training. So gmb.fitness, I think is the website, or if you just Google GMB Fitness, tons of great resources there. Uh, you're gonna get some great stuff uh, from that. But basically any type of strength training that requires mobility is a good place to start uh, because the best mobility training is strength training that requires mobility like deep squats and uh, pike push-ups. You know, when you get up to the top of a pike push-up in that downward doggy kind of uh, position, you know, push your shoulders, uh, you know, extend, uh, or technically that's flexing, flex your shoulders as much as you can sort of thing. Just getting a little bit more mobility in your strength training is probably a good place to start with that. Excuse me. Uh, throat, throat is still raw from whatever happened on that ride the other day. It was crazy. Uh, David Baker, Baker, excuse me, Baker, uh, saying, hey, Matt, something's not clicking with me with the intuitive training. Please do share. Yes. If there's not structure in a program, and if I change things up frequently, it seems like tracking progress is difficult. And that's why I created the scoreboard progression log, my friend. Uh, it's not down below in the description, but uh, I think there's a link down below to the RDP merch store. And in the RDP merch store is the link to is a uh, the uh, scoreboard progression log. It's a it's a uh, tracking system that I've developed over the years, and it's a simple PDF that explains how it works. It takes nothing more than a simple Google document kind of thing, and it gives you that blend of structured flexibility. Because you're right, you need some degree of structure to keep moving forward, and you need some degree of flexibility. And the approach with intuitive training is such that you have enough structure that you stay on track and you keep moving forward. And that, again, largely is what an, an objective-based approach gives you. Because if you're like, yay, intuitive training, I'll do burpees today, I'll go swimming today, I'll play racquetball, I'm going to do Olympic lifting. If you're way all over the place and you don't have an objective, then yeah, you don't have enough structure to actually go anywhere. You're just randomly doing whatever but you need enough structure, but too much structure can be stifling and restrictive. Um, and so you need some degree of flexibility. If you have too much flexibility, you don't have enough structure to keep you going. So that's why this approach with intuitive training and again with the uh, scoreboard progression log, or you could just simply use a blank sheet of paper. That's why I'm not a big fan of like classic workout log spreadsheet styles and stuff, too restrictive. It's too structured. Like, I don't want to fill in little stupid boxes in my workouts all day long. I don't want, because as soon as you put something down, it's like, you've got a list of six exercises. You've now locked in your workout. These are the exercises you do. This is the order. And this is how you do them. I don't want to train like that. I don't want to be so limited and restricted. And the scoreboard progression log allows you to have the structure but also the flexibility, the perfect blend between the two. And that way you get the best of both worlds with no downsides. Outstanding question. I love where you're thinking, man. Very good and very intuitive. Uh, Esteban is saying, hey Matt, do you think running uphill or added weight is a good enough exercise to work the legs or is it not good enough for placement for squats, et cetera? So always remember that your ability to get a particular result depends on how much you achieve that objective. So you have to ask yourself, is that enough to achieve the objective of what are we looking for uh, to work the legs? Okay, what are we working the legs for? Strength, endurance, power, explosiveness. That's, that's what we need. What's the objective? We can't make any decisions if we don't know what our objective is. Otherwise, again, you know, you're going off of work. What kind of work are you doing? How hard are you working? I, I don't care how hard you work. We need to know whether or not it's in alignment with that objective. So let's just say, for example, strength. It's like, I want stronger legs. Okay, great. Now we have an objective. How much tension is in the muscle? That's what strength is. So the question to ask yourself is, if you put on like, uh, you know, a, a, a ruck pack, you know, weighted vest or something, and you go uphill, of course, it depends on how steep that hill is. I mean, if you guys ever come out here, <laughs> I will take you to Philip S. Morris Park to the mini incline. I mean, that sucker, that is steep enough that 
it's hard to get up it at all. <laughs> and boy, but believe me, by the time you get to the top of that, your legs are lead. They are absolutely shot. Am I working strength in my legs on that? Absolutely. <laughs> you know, it is really hard to get up that sucker. But if there's just this casual, nice little incline in the park, not as much. So that's what you're looking for. How much tension is in your muscles? And you can go with the cost with a comparison too. So go and do some climbing and hill sprints up a steep staircase or something. Pay attention to how hard you're contracting your muscles. You can go by feel and then go to the gym and hit a heavy set of leg presses or lunges and stuff like that. The answer should be pretty darn obvious if it does matter. If you do both and you're like, I don't know, it kind of feels about the same. That's probably about the same. But if you do this, uh, uh, the hill sprints, you're like, yeah, legs are pretty work. That was pretty hard. But then you go and you do some hover lunges, you know, with a weight vest on and you get like a five by five and you're like, whoa, holy smokes. That was a lot more tension in the muscle. There you go. That's your answer. That's what's helping you achieve the objective. Because again, when things are effective, it should be blatantly obvious. <laughs> it should not be something that is guesswork. And that's why understanding the fundamental objectives of your training is so important. Because if I shoot an arrow at a target and I miss the, well, miss the whole darn target, that's happened, <laughs> but I miss the bullseye by a good six inches, I don't need to stand there and wonder, was that effective? Did I, did I get what I wanted? No, it's obvious because I know what my target was. I'm like, oh, missed it. But it's also obvious when you hit it because you know what the objective is. When we don't know what a training objective is, any amount of work is always going to lead to guesswork. And we're always going to wonder, was that effective? I think it was effective. Maybe it was effective. What do you think about that? That's when you don't know what you're doing, when you don't know what your objective is. And unfortunately for a lot of us, myself included back in the day, is when you don't know what you're doing, the default becomes just work harder, which is a very dangerous place to be in because hard work is a liability and you're just basically throwing money at the proverbial problem. You know, always beware of the hardest worker in the room because it's usually the most incompetent worker in the room as well, because they don't know what they're doing. Don't worry about how much we're working. Worry about how productive you are. How productive are you about achieving that objective? So when we have questions like running uphill with added weight versus squats, all right, should be pretty obvious which one is more productive at the objective you're after. A couple last questions here, Cristobal. Hey, Matt, what's your opinion about door pull-up bars? I like them. I mean, there's the duonomic pull-up bars, the Elvias, uh, which also have the ring system, which is really cool. Uh, I've got a set of them here. I think they're one of the best out there. Pricier than others, for sure, but, you know, you buy quality. Also, the pull-up dip company uh, uh, that uh, has a kind of elevated one because some doorway, you know, the handles are lower. You're not going to get much of a hang, but that's a lot higher. It's a little bit better design kind of thing. One of the things, though, that I just don't like about the doorway pull-up bars, and this is just a personal thing, is for me, the best pull-up bar is a simple straight bar. Anything that's got the different grips and the handles and stuff is just limiting you. So that's why I love my dash, because it's just a simple straight bar. Best pull-up bar in the world is just a simple straight bar, because you can put anything up there. I could put handles for different grips and everything, or I could take it down. I could put up uh, my suspension straps from NOSC. I could do a million things with that. But once you have dedicated handles, which most doorway pull-up bars do, uh, you're limiting yourself uh, to a degree. You're restricted. Uh, so that's my biggest gripe about it. But on the other hand, it's like, dude, you get a doorway pull-up bar, you got a gym. You know, calisthenics, progressive calisthenics especially, as Al Cavadlo always says, you just need a place to hang, maybe a wall, and the floor beneath your feet. And if you don't have the floor beneath your feet, you got bigger problems. So it's especially for people who are starting out and they're like, I just... I don't have the ability to work out. I don't have a gym or anything like that. Maybe you can afford like a $40 pull-up unit that you find on Amazon. Great, good. Yeah, you just need a place to hang. You can be a tight wadded, um, picky, snobbish pull-up bar aficionado like me uh, later on when you get more dialed into exactly what you like. And uh, that then you you know you upgrade to other fancier pieces of equipment as as you can or, or wish to do so. Uh, but yeah, I, they're good. They're, they're not bad for sure. Um, and then Cristobal follows up saying, what are your thoughts on training with heavy loads 
going all the way to failure. Too risky. Is it worth it? Uh, it's funny you should ask this because I was just thinking about this today is that with my grind style approach, we have our strength and proficiency phase and we have our uh, hypertrophy slash finisher phase, two phases of the workout. And the strength of proficiency is heavy or do your skills, but you stay away from failure because the objective here is to get your body better at using a skill. And yes, strength is a skill. And fatigue is the enemy of skill because you just can't do things well when you're tired. It's this simple human physiology. Again, the, when my instructor was like, you guys are gassing out after two rounds in free sparring. And it's like, yeah, all the black belts are sharp, crisp techniques. But by the end of the round, we all look like white belts because we're just, you know, flailing around because we're tired. You know, everybody sucks when they're tired. So when we're trying to get stronger or more proficient at a skill, fatigue is the enemy. You don't want too much fatigue. So that's why we have that phase in our strength training. So heavy, yes, don't take it to failure. It's, it's harder to get to fatigue too. It's just harder to do it with that because you're probably going to uh, have more neural and mental limitations than anything. But then you have your hypertrophy phase at the end where you drop the, the weight or the resistance considerably. So instead of going with heavy and low rep, now we're going moderate, lighter loads, much higher rep. And in GSC, the uh, recommendation is usually strength and uh, proficiency phase is three to five repetitions-ish. But then the hypertrophy phase is like 10, 12, 20 repetitions. And that makes it a hell of a lot easier to push to failure, a hell of a lot easier to build up that fatigue, a hell of a lot easier to reach the upper levels of recruitment. And it's a heck of a lot safer to do so. So that way, you know, when you're going heavy, you have pros, you have cons. When you go lighter, you have pros, you have cons. You do both, you have no cons. It's all good. It's all beneficial. It feels amazing too. It feels really, really good. And that's the grind style calisthenics approach. So that's why if you're trying to combine the two, you're always going to feel like you're fighting yourself with it and making compromises. I don't like to train with compromises. I like to just get what I want. All right. And a couple of follow-up comments here. One more here. Thallus. Thales, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. My apologies if I'm butchering names here, folks. I, I was never a very good reader back in school. But anyway, saying, hi, Matt. I just want to say thanks. Thank you very much for watching. Your vids on how to approach the pull-up exercise in the sagittal plane instead of the vertical helped me go from zero to seven times. Thank you very much. Very good. Glad to help, folks. Glad to help where I can. I mean, gosh, I don't know how many videos I've got on my YouTube channel now at this point, but quite a few. And I always make them with the single goal to help you out because, you know, I know the stuff that I put out there. It's helped me already. So chances are, if it helped me, I do hope that it helps you as well. Christopher saying, can you give us tips on injury prevention for strength training? Oh, great. So I kind of already alluded to some of it of when you're going heavy, or when you're doing things that require skill, stay away from the failure kind of stuff. Fatigue is the enemy. Fatigue is a liability in that case. Usually for the finishers in grind style calisthenics, we use really technically simple exercises. You know, bicep curls, chest flies, simple basic push-ups. The things that if your form starts to break down, you're still pretty safe. So think about it that way. Like when it comes to injury prevention, a lot of times we get these injuries just because we're doing things that require skill and strength to be safe. And then we're trying to embrace fatigue. It's not a good formula, my friend, because you're literally playing chicken with a wall. You're, you're doing a chicken race with a wall. It's like, how close can I run at the wall before I hurt myself? You're either going to stop short or hurt yourself. There's no happy ending here. Okay, so use strength and proficiency for things that require strength, but, but stay away from the fatigue. And then for, if you want the fatigue, go after things that you can just destroy yourself with and you're still relatively safe. A uh, second of all, is you always listen to your body, this is again, intuitive training is always about looking at your circumstances. So if you have leg day, for example, and you get a few good sets of lunges in, but you notice pew, your strength and energy just nose dies after that, why are you still going? Yeah, you can still create something, some more of that objective, but why? 
high cost, low reward. It's not worth it. So pay attention to if you just feel like things are starting to peter out. Don't force the body to do things. You know, we work with the body, not against it, as I always tell my clients. Uh, we always respect pain, too. You know, we always respect pain. I'm always telling clients, I'm a terrible mind reader. If you do something and you're like, I don't know why, but this hurts my wrist, tell me these things. Because we should never do anything that's hurting you. Pain is weakness, full stop. It doesn't make you tougher. It doesn't make you macho. It doesn't build endurance. It doesn't, it doesn't do no good whatsoever. Now, it's different from discomfort. You know, the burning in the muscle and everything, that's great. Go for that. But pain will always hold you back to any degree. So get rid of it in any way you can. Embrace comfort. Seek comfort any way that you can. Because any amount of unnecessary pain and discomfort is only going to hold you back. Because then you can put that energy into dealing with that to actually doing better in the workout. Uh, and then lastly is uh, when something is happening and it's just kind of persistent, get it checked out. See a doctor or a PT or athletic trainer or something like Don't do the guesswork kind of thing. Uh, don't go on Google and be like, why does my shoulder hurt when I do push-ups? There's a thousand reasons that could be happening. You know, and again, you're doing guesswork. See someone about it. Get it fixed as soon as possible. Because a lot of times injuries are one of those things that start small and then they get bigger over time. And it's like, well, if you dealt with this three weeks ago when it was nothing, you would still be fine. But now you insisted on still trying those kettlebell snatches, even though it hurt your shoulder. And now you got a torn rotator cuff kind of thing. So listen to your body. Prevention is the key. Remember, this whole exercise thing should feel good <laughs> for your body. Yeah, it's challenging and stuff, but it shouldn't feel painful. Like, oh man, these lunges really hurt my knees. Then something's wrong. <laughs> Pain is mother nature's way of telling you that something is definitely wrong and you need to pay attention to it. And not only will fixing whatever that thing is remove the risk of the injury, but also makes the exercise a hell of a lot more effective too. You get better at it as well. So there you go, folks. Intuitive training. And a lot more on this in the books down below in the description, particularly micro workouts in my Grind Style Calisthenics book. Check out some of the other resources. It helps to support the show here. Uh, again, this podcast is free for you, but it is not free for me. I've always got more equipment here right behind the camera that I've got set up. So um, God, my whole kitchen looks like a studio at this point. I'm always spending money on stuff. So thank you very much, everybody, for the support, coming in with your questions, and uh, all of the support in general for the RDP YouTube channel. It's much appreciated. And I will see you folks next week with a new hot topic. Haven't decided on what that is yet, but drop me ideas on the Instagram, uh, Red Delta Project on Instagram. If you've got anything particular that you would like me to cover, I'd be happy to address it for you. So I'll talk to you then, folks. Till then, be fit and live free.